everyone. Can I please get your attention one more time? Please, a couple of really quick important announcements. Thank you. Y'all are gonna get tired of seeing me, okay? I'm Lisi, I'm the Vice President of UPRS here on campus. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, and this over here is Marielle. Um, so just a couple of quick announcements as we get ready uh, to start our main event. Um, first of all, we'd like to encourage you to try to move forward as much as you can. Um, just take the, your belongings off the seat next to you if it's not being used. Try to consolidate. This way, if people come in a little bit after the program, they don't disrupt and just kind of sneak into the back. Y'all know what I'm saying? Um, in addition, we have a caption service set up over here to my left, your right. Um, so if anybody is going to need anything like that, we encourage you to move this way. We will make accommodations for you. If it is needed, just let one of us know, me or Marielle or anybody else with a badge, and we will get that, sort we will get that sorted out for you. Um, secondly, the Sam Kirk exhibit is now moving into this back corner, kind of where the food is. Um, we really do want to encourage you guys to go and check out that art. And again, I just want a reminder, um, all of those proceeds are going to La Escuela de Artes Plásticas, which is in dire need of help. Um, so please try to check that out. Um, and we do have some other um, Richard Santiago pieces are on sale as well. And lastly, and this is the most important one, um, because I know some of you are going to have questions for the mayor. So what's going to happen for this? Um, some note cards will be passed down on your row. If you have a question, please, please write down your question on the note card. The note cards will be collected, and then they will be handed to the mayor to answer. So no one's going to be going up to any microphones or anything like that. Write your questions on the note cards that are provided. They will be collected at the end, and all of those questions written on note cards will be answered. If there's any other questions regarding these, um, you can see myself, anybody with a tag. Um, you can see Andy, and we will sort that out for you, okay? So just remember, note cards for questions. Sam Kirk and baskets in the back, and um, please try to move forward and just make some space for people who are still coming in, okay? Um, we are gonna hopefully get started soon. Um, we're still waiting on a couple of things, so we appreciate your patience. Um, thank you so much again for coming out and for supporting us, us as an org, Social Justice, Puerto Rico, um, and we hope that you enjoy the program. Thank you. Adelante!
right. All right, welcome everyone. Hello everyone, welcome, uh, welcome to Chicago. Welcome to the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, my name is Andy Clano. I'm the uh, acting director of the Social Justice Initiative here and a member of the organizing team for today's symposium. Uh, our guest speaker, Mayor Carmen Yulin Cruz, is running a couple of minutes late, so we're gonna start off with a, a short film that's been produced by our community partners, the Puerto Rican Agenda, about the work that's been happening in Chicago to support uh, the people of Puerto Rico and the project of rebuilding uh, since last September. Uh, so Samuel Reyes, the, the filmmaker, is gonna come up here and just introduce the film very briefly, and then we'll uh, continue with our program. Thank you. Buenas noches a todos y todas. Good evening. Uh, I want to say thank you uh, for letting me, to, I'll screen this one more time <laughs> today. Uh, but uh, this is a short preview of what's going to become a, a larger piece, a larger documentary. And uh, this is chronicling the last seven months of uh, the Puerto Rican Agenda's efforts to uh, rescue, uh, rebuild, uh, relief and rebuild Puerto Rico. All right, thank you. It's nearly seven months since the people who heard the left and already economically fragile is not in the capital of Puerto Rico. In early September, when we got word of Hurricane Ima making its way towards Puerto Rico, we came together as a collective confused because all the Media attention was being directed to Florida, Louisiana, Texas, and we knew we needed to do something to call out the fact that Puerto Rico was being excluded from the public discourse. So we called a press conference on September 8th. Good afternoon. My name is Christina Passionizades. I'm the co-chair of the Puerto Rican Agenda. I stand here in solidarity with community leaders across Humboldt Park who represent the Puerto Rican diaspora. I believe that the Puerto Rican agenda's rapid response and organized response was due to the fact that we already had entered into discussions prior to Hurricane Maria, uh, actually prior to Hurricane Irma, that we were not going to do something that was based on just an emergency response. Within 48 hours, members assessed the immediate needs on the island purchased pallets of emergency supplies, secured transportation courtesy of a custom trucking company, and loaded the first cargo plane underwritten by United Airlines. Supplies arrived in San Juan, Puerto Rico on Monday, September 25th, and were received by Mayor Carmen Julin Cruz for distribution across the island. We are dying, and you are killing us with the inefficiency and the bureaucracy. We will make it with or without you. Because what stands behind me is all due to the generosity of other people. Again, this is what we got last night. Four pallets of water, three pallets of meals, and 12 pallets of infant food, which I gave them to Comerillo where people are drinking off a creek. I'm working with the Red Cross and the Salvation Army to support the needs of evacuees coming from the island. Here I'd like to add a point. While a lot of this is talk about what we're going to be sending, we had a meeting to discuss how we can also receive and help people resettle. Aquí en casi dos mil hemos servido en el centro de bienvenida. Y algo en que extraordinario que hizo esta ciudad con, a través del liderato del, del alcalde eh, eh, citó eh, el departamento de emergencia de la ciudad de Chicago para que creara una infraestructura en anticipación a esta 
I think you were witnessing what 12 years ago, Hurricane Katrina, what I would call the first time of massive climate change resettlement. This is another phase of a climate change resettlement. We now, as a country, we as a city, have to be prepared for that. La agenda puertorriqueña lo que está haciendo es facilitando ese proceso de ayudar a Puerto Rico y al mismo tiempo ayudar a los puertorriqueños que quieren venir para Chicago. Con una mano, eh, ayudamos a la economía de Puerto Rico, a los artistas de Puerto Rico, a los empresarios de Puerto Rico y a las organizaciones sin fines de lucro en Puerto Rico. Y por otro lado, le damos la mano a los puertorriqueños que necesitan ese momento de claridad, esos meses en el exterior o años o toda la vida que necesiten para recomponer sus vidas. I never thought of myself, I'm sorry, but we can take this again. I never thought of myself catching Stan and I'm Rome and I'm Suela and, and these things and putting them in a maleta to take to Puerto Rico. I never thought I'd see the day, but that's what you gotta do. Uh, and I'm not the only one that did it, right? That's me, I saw so many wonderful Puerto Rican young men and women taking care of their moms and their grandmas and going down there and taking care of them. The Puerto Rican agenda's signature strategy is crystallized. They resolve to spend their energy on raising to purchase ballots directly from Puerto Rican distributors and work closely with Puerto Rican officials and nonprofit organizations to distribute supplies and issue microgrants. <laughs> Since the beginning, we have raised nearly $400,000, and we can say that that money has come back to Puerto Rico in the form of micro grants. Total, we have touched 30 towns. Grassroots initiatives throughout the diaspora and local efforts on the island, not the federal government, have saved lives in Puerto Rico. The home mayor, Carmen Green Group, praised Chicago as a first responder and continued supporter. She keeps the video on her personal cell phone, showing truckloads of emergency supplies making their way to the distribution center just days after the storm. I have two things. If the government, right, would have simply followed the example of the American people, if the American people are immensely generous and giving and caring and loving, our government is simply a reflection of the will of the people. Wow, right now Puerto Rico have electricity and water and things could have been stabilized. Since September, members have made numerous visits to deliver aid directly to those in need. During a March visit, along with the Chicago delegation, Puerto Rican Agenda co-chair Tina Castillo Salles shares the observations for analyzing the situation and what remains to be done. And we're now ready and stronger than ever in terms of building this island back with Puerto Rican labor, Puerto Rican investments to be that 21st century island. This is an unfortunate event, but it's an opportunity for us to transform the island in the way that we always wanted it to be. Strong, safe, and a collective enterprise where Puerto Ricans are determining their own destiny and actualization. Now I'd like to introduce Christiana, Christiana Ray Colon. She's a poet, a playwright, and an educator, a member of the Let Us Breathe Collective. She has a, a play that's actually running here at UIC in the theater uh, that closes tomorrow called Florissant and uh, Canfield, based upon uh, the work that the Let Us Breathe Collective did in Ferguson during the uprising. Um, so please join me in welcoming Christiana, who's going to uh, perform for us.
Club well I used to pray with. This is for the dangerous words hiding in the pages of composition notes, holy books, and Sanskrit. This is for the patients who wait for medication, for the mothers microwaving beans and rice at day's end. This is for the marching bands and girls at quinceanera, the skaters and the writers whose moms are eroteras laughing, cops don't scare us, we sad so elders fear us, we will rewrite your textbooks in our own language if you dare us. This is for the Sarahs, the Angelicas, the Shawns, the Beatrices, Paulas, the Daniellas, and the Dawns. We scribble sunlight in the margins of horizons with our songs for all the voices tangled with the silence on our tongues. Fireworks at dark, rivals in the park, tired shirts that sweat your scent on hangers in the closet. For the boys who fix the faucet while their sister fixes coffee because mommy had to leave for work at 6 a.m. and laundry isn't folded yet. You don't have to hold your breath. You don't have to behave. Stage your own rebellion. Paint canvases with rage and religion and prayers for the pilgrims sleeping in the train cars at the border and their children. Filibuster Senate and buff markers on the pink line. Stay in the prosecution's case and force the judge to resign. Force the crowd to rewind the lyrics you invented. Speak away the limits to the height of your existence. Be a witness. Be a weapon, be a testament, a triumph. Set your poems flying in the glitter of the planet. Feed open mouths with truth. The truth is we are famished. The universe is starving for the symphonies you play. Clarinets and thunder and the syllables you say are the instruments. You are infinite. Stretch your hands to heaven. Let your throat rattle the rhythms of all your fallen brethren. Your legacy is present. Your history is now. You are the tenth degree of sound. You are the nephews of the sky. You are the bass line and the hi-hat and the snare drum and the cry of red Septembers. You are the architects of winter. You are the builders of the roads that you're told you don't remember. You are the builders of the roads that you're told you don't remember. You are the builders of the roads that you're told you don't remember. Gate City Hall to splinters and tell them you remember. Send diamonds to your islands and tell them you remember. Cast your poems in the river and tell them you remember. Find your God inside your mirror and tell her you remember. Thank you, Christiana Colon. Let's give her one more round of applause. That was amazing. Good evening, and welcome to UIC and to the keynote address for our day-long symposium, Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria, and the Crisis of Colonialism. I am Susan Poser. I'm the Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs here at UIC. And I am delighted to have the privilege of welcoming the Honorable Carmen Eulene Cruz, Mayor of San Juan, to the University of Illinois at Chicago. We are honored to have her with us and look forward to her address. I bring with me greetings from Chancellor Michael Amaridis, uh, the Chancellor of UIC, who could not be here uh, today. He had to be in Washington, DC, and he is very sorry uh, to be missing this incredible event. I also, uh, it is also a pleasure for me to welcome here UIC alumna and former board member of the Board of Trustees of the University of Illinois, Ada Lopez. Welcome. <laughs> we still have in our minds the images that were televised to our living rooms of the overwhelming damage that Maria caused to Puerto Rico and of Mayor Eileen Cruz's passionate efforts in its aftermath. Her efforts included physically working to clear debris herself, to comfort neighbors and her constituents, while at the same time pleading with the federal government for help. What we saw from afar here in Chicago and around the world was both heartbreaking and inspiring. During those days, the world witnessed what true leadership looks like. Mayor Eulene Cruz was in the trenches doing physical and emotional labor while at the same time tirelessly advocating for her people. 
Now, UIC has not been on the sidelines during this crisis, as you just saw in that film. As Chicago's largest and only public research university and one of the, of, of the most diverse universities in the nation, our mission of access, equity, and community stretches all the way to San Juan. After the hurricane, our students organized their own relief efforts along with Chicago's, including traveling to Puerto Rico to assist. On the academic side, UIC is providing financial support to current and prospective students from Puerto Rico. We are waiving the application and orientation fees and providing flexibility regarding documents that may not be easily obtainable due to hurricane damage. We also participated in an application week in San Juan in December 2017, and UIC's Academic and Enrollment Services partnered with the Office of Student Financial Aid and Scholarships to provide counseling and assist Puerto Rican students and families with admission and financial aid applications. I am proud of the work that UIC faculty and staff are undertaking with the students in order to do our part both as individuals and through various units and organizations on campus and in our community in Chicago. All of this to assist our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico. Before the mayor... <laughs> Before the mayor is introduced, I would like to welcome Dr. Amalia Payaras to make a few remarks. Dr. <laughs> Maybe I don't need to tell you who she is. Um, she, you may not know this actually, she's now the Associate Chancellor and Vice Provost for Diversity here at UIC, as well as a professor in the Department of Political Science and Latin American and Latino Studies. I give you Amalia Payaras. Thank you very much, Susan. As Vice Provost of Diversity, I'm, pr I'm proud to say that here at UIC, we strive to turn our demographic diversity into intersecting communities of solidarity in which students' individual goals are supported by our seven vibrant cultural centers and in which students also learn to work towards a better future, developing a commitment to the collective, a sense of responsibility and accountability to communities in need, and a desire to pursue social justice, including but not limited to health justice, environmental, economic, and gender justice. I cannot think of a better role model to have on our campus than Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz. I want to let Mayor Cruz know that not only is there a long history of ties between Chicago and the island, but he, that here at UIC, Puerto Rican students have played a central and vital role in shaping our campus culture and creating social change for many decades. To name a few, yes. <laughs> to name a few, 45 years ago, Puerto Rican students joined Mexican students in engaging in a powerful mobilization to add Latino studies to the curriculum, as well as Latino faculty. Yeah, so now we're in the house. Their efforts led to the ultimate creation of three units, Latin American and Latino studies, LADIS, and the Latino Cultural Center. Many of us, myself included, would not be here today if it were not for those efforts. The Puerto Rican Student Association, now UPRS, has also been active for decades and is today probably one of the most, if not the most, active uh, Puerto Rican student organization in the Chicago area with its social and cultural programming of... <laughs> and its annual Palante. In the 90s, uh, some of these students played a key role in creating Noche de Poetas, which has, is, we still host at UIC. <laughs> in which Puerto Rican and many Latino and now students of many cultures continue the tradition of spoken word, poetry, 
music and dance. Just last night, one of my uh, former grad students posted that the drummers were there, were here at USC in Noche Poetas teaching people how to dance bomba. So it continues. And finally, Puerto Rican faculty and administrators who have contributed enormously to our scholarship, to our programming, to our teaching, to our mentoring, and to our university leadership. Um, even here tonight, we have one of our faculty members who played a crucial role in turning UIC into an HSI, uh, Hispanic Serving Institution, and that is Aix Alfonso. And finally, one of my favorite people to talk about, what if our lecturers in Latin American and Latino studies, uh, it would take an hour to talk about all the incredible things he has done in his lifelong of activism for the Puerto Rican community and Puerto Rican culture here in Chicago. But he has always been bridging academia with his experiences, and he has taken students in life-changing field trips uh, and he has also brought to many, many Puerto Rican and Latino voices to UIC to help educate our students on social conditions in Puerto Rico, in Chicago, and the world. And let me just welcome again Jose Lopez, who wants to be Uh, Amalia was extremely generous. Amalia is an amazing woman, an amazing scholar, and lived in Puerto Rico, and her father is buried, chose to be buried in Puerto Rico. I definitely think that that says a great deal about her commitment, her family's commitment to Puerto Rico. This has been an amazing week. 23 years ago, and there's some students here that were part of building this conference, the Parante Conference. And it continues to this day, led by the Union for Puerto Rican Students here on campus. And this event tonight would not have been, would not have been made possible without the incredible support of the Social Justice Initiative. I want you to thank both of them with a loud applause. There were a lot of other people who made this, but without their work, without their commitment, um, without Andrew's leadership, this would not have happened. Thank you, thank you. I wanna also acknowledge tonight one of my favorite intellectuals. I wanna acknowledge um, the amazing work that Yarimar Bonilla has done. She has truly become, she has truly become the Puerto Rican public intellectual. Yarimar, where are you? Stand up. Come on, stand up, Yarimar. Parate. Yarimar just won the Carnegie Award to do research on a book on Puerto Rico. There are obviously a lot of people here that made this possible. I also want to acknowledge the work and contribution of our own Michael Rodriguez, Dr. Michael Rodriguez from Northwestern. During the darkest hours and the darkest moments of Puerto Rico's history, following the massive arrest of hundreds of Puerto Rican nationalists as a result of the Hajuja uprising of 1950, inside a dungeon of La Princesa prison, the legendary Pedro Albizu Campos was confronted by one of his lieutenants. Maestro, todo está perdido. ¿Qué haremos ahora? Everything is lost. What should we do now? Albizu responded with a great serenity 
and said, La patria está pasando por su gloriosa transfiguración. The homeland is undergoing its glorious transformation. And after Maria, after this devastating natural phenomena, which was really exacerbated by the unnatural relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States, a colonial relationship. Seven months after, look at this room. Look at how the Puerto Rican diaspora has organized in every town, in every city to respond to the crisis of Puerto Rico. And today you saw images of how Puerto Ricans at the grassroots level responded in a glorious way. Puerto Rico is undergoing its glorious transformation. The Puerto Rican agenda in Chicago has played an amazing role, led by two young Puerto Rican women. Okay? And this role has led to harnessing over $400,000 in cash, and we have delivered in micro grants to 30 towns in Puerto Rico. And we were the first to reach Puerto Rico with a plane load of supplies and food delivered to none other than our guest tonight, our honored guest, the amazing woman who I believe is going to lead Puerto Rico through this glorious transformation. This woman, like my mother used to say, no tiene pelo en la lengua. She took on the imperial Trump and challenged him and was not intimidated. She was and has been our David with a slingshot confronting the Goliath. I just want you to understand that the first day I got to Puerto Rico, by the way, you should know that her candidacy officially was announced for mayor while she was in Chicago, and we were doing a little fundraiser for her, not knowing that she was actually going to be certified. And as she was speaking at the National Museum of Puerto Rican Arts and Culture, she gets a call, and she was certified to run for mayor of San Juan. And her own party and every political pundit thought that was impossible. And she made it happen, and she became the mayor of San Juan. And when I went to visit her for the first time, I'm going into her office, and there are all these signed covenants. You want to talk about participatory democracy? This woman organized every community, or not organized, every community that was organized. She went to them and said, let's make a covenant. And what do you want during the next four years from the mayor of San Juan. And all of those are in her office, signed by the communities and signed by her. And she has lived up to every single one of those pledges. Tell me about participatory democracy, and I'll show it in San Juan, Puerto Rico. When the governor of Puerto Rico could not respond, and FEMA did not respond, every single, everything that was left that she could garner in San Juan went to the municipalities that did not have it. 
then talk to me about generosity. And when we needed someone to raise her voice for the freedom of my brother, Oscar Lopez Rivera, whose daughter is here. Clarissa, where are you? She's somewhere around here. Um, <laughs> she's working. Carmen Yuling has her working very hard. But my brother will, will celebrate a year on May 17th of his freedom. This woman took Oscar legally under her custody with Congressman Luis Gutierrez and delivered him to his daughter's house three months before he was officially in, let go by the orders of President Obama. That has never been done in the history of the United States. And by the way, my brother is the first person in the history of the United States to be given a pardon by two presidents. But this woman had the courage to go to the prison at, in Indiana, in Terre Haute, at 5 o'clock in the morning with my niece to pick up my brother with Congressman Luis Gutierrez. And he was delivered safe and obviously filled with joy to our family in Puerto Rico. This is a woman who I think is just beginning to make history. Time Magazine has selected her as one of the most 100 most influential people in the world. This is who we have as our guest of honor tonight, Carmen Yulin. this, perhaps you'll be disappointed, but uh, we have a little video for you. It's in Spanish and English and Spanglish, so we wanted you to see it um, before we started. What, do I have to do something? Can we get the lights, please? <laughs> what, you're going to turn off the lights for me?
from your hearts. You are good people. Help us. I have very little voice, but whatever voice I have left, I am going to use to make sure that people don't die.
place for the inefficiency and the bureaucracy. Seven months ago today, Hurricane Maria savagely destroyed Puerto Rico. A couple of weeks before that, Hurricane Irma had begun doing the exact same thing. And we still see those videos and feel as if it was today, because to this day, between 75,000 and 100,000 Puerto Ricans still don't have electricity. Because at this day, 500,000 roofs need to be either totally or partially built. Because our suicide rate has gone 55%, has gone up 55%. Because we don't even know how many people died from the botched effort of an administration that wasn't that they couldn't do it, it was that they didn't get it. President Trump had absolutely no sense of urgency regarding the lives of people of Puerto Rico. He thought it was okay for him to go down to Puerto Rico and throw paper towels at us. Coño, que bien lo dijiste. ¿De dónde tú eres? Soy nacida en Chicago, de padre de Ah, pues eres boricua. And he didn't even stay for the night. He could have stayed at Air Force One. And he didn't even walk around where people could touch him or see him. You know, rather than being the comforter in chief, he was the hater in chief. But then again, that should have not surprised many people. So, although I thank the provost for her kind words and Jose made me, Jose, I thought I was like seven feet tall when he was talking about it. I'm like, shit, did I do all of that? You know. <laughs> I did what I had to do. I did what any of you would have done. In fact, the city of Chicago, five days after Maria, September 25th, was the first one to bring provisions to Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rican Agenda, Luis Gutierrez and Ram Emanuel. You know, so give yourself a big hand. When the federal government was saying that the logistics were too much, unsurmountable was the word they used. I mean, they can put a man in the moon 238,900 miles away. But they can't take water to an I love your nasty t-shirt. <laughs> I have a bunch of nasty women here. <laughs> you know what nasty means, right? Nasty is what a bully calls a woman that can get things done. So on September 5th, when the federal government was saying, look, you know, we can't get there, it's too much, it's, we don't have the amount of equipment, we don't have, the city of Chicago and the people of Chicago and the Puerto Rico agenda of Chicago took 75,000 pounds of life-saving food, water, medicine. And people in this room may have not known it, but you literally saved lives. So at the time, we were told that help was already in Puerto Rico. 
and I waited patiently. I tried to be a good girl. I waited patiently, and you know, while he was at Mar-a-Lago playing golf, I was up to here on water with human excrement, doing what I had to do. Not because I'm a mayor, but because I'm human. And when humans whose blood flows through their veins see other humans in need, they go and they help. That's what people do, period. You don't ask for a memo. You don't ask for, maldita sea la palabra, assessment. <laughs> My communicator's director there. Is there anybody in the house that can give CPR because she's going to need it soon? <laughs> They were asking, FEMA was asking in a place where there was absolutely no power, total blackout, for people to go to the internet to ask for assistance. And they would actually hand out the paper, and you know, it was a very nice paper. It would say, you know, and we, we're sorry, something like, we're sorry that you've gone through this, but you know, please log into www. Dot, we had other names for that, but you know, can't tell them right here. And help wasn't getting to Puerto Rico. So when I said people were dying, I wasn't being dramatic. People were dying. Those hands that you see on that video are from an elderly home where people were waving from the inside. People started riding with whatever they could and putting signs outside their homes or outside the apartment buildings. Because you see, when you don't have electricity and you live in an apartment building, as many of you probably do, the water doesn't pump up. And when garbage doesn't get collected for the fifth, sixth, seventh week in a row, and people still throw the garbage through the chute, it starts adding up. I've said it many times, and I'll say it again, I, I, I'm not the same person that I was on September 20th for, for a couple of reasons. One is I had never seen poverty like I saw then. And you say, well, but you're the mayor of San Juan. How come you? No, you know, it's one thing to know poverty from here. And then it's another thing to experience it from here. When Rosa Clemente went down to Puerto Rico and interviewed me, I told her that we will no longer be able to hide our inequality and our inefficiencies and our discrimination behind some palm trees and piña coladas. Because you see, as Puerto Ricans, we also have to own up to what we haven't done right. Because as bad as it was for President Trump to do what he did, there were people on the other side that didn't say, wait a minute, Mr. President, enough. You know, you can be respectful, but be truthful. And at times like this, you have two choices. You stand up and speak the truth, and let the chips fall where they may, or you stand down and are an accomplice to the injustice and the indignity that follows. Those are your two choices. Right here in this room many, many years ago, how many years ago, Alejandro? Where's Alejandro, how many years ago? 19, tell me. Seven years. 73. <laughs> Who gives more? <laughs> but right, right, right here in this room, I told the muchacha with the height, right here in this room, some people made a choice to stand up. And they decided to pay the price. And look, some people may agree with them, some people may not agree with them, but you gotta respect people that put their money where their mouth is 
that put their liberty where their passion is. So we have two of them right here. Levanta la mano, come on. Let's give them a big hand. Son tres. Come on, we can't hear you. And I'll tell you a story about the one there standing near Clarissa. I was sworn in as mayor on uh, the 14th of January, and on the 15th of January, I walked through in what nobody expected. Nobody expected me to win. You know, she's a woman, she's little. <laughs> she talks to all these people that people don't talk to, you know, the LGBTQ community, the teachers, the unions, the taxi drivers, the students, the feminists. The, the immigrants, the undocumented people, oh my God, you know. So she'll never win, you know. And I kept saying, yes, you know, because the power of love really is stronger than the power of hate. It truly is, it's not poetic, it's truth. And I thought, how about of all those people that other people never pay attention to, join together, and we have the capacity not to say we all think alike in everything, but we have a capacity to say we're going to work towards a particular set of goals. That doesn't mean we agree on every single issue, but it means that on this particular things, we're going to agree and we're going to move forward. So, you know, we're brand new. I mean, we beat a 12-year incumbent. And my secretary, who I didn't know was my secretary at the time, <laughs> just walked in and said, hay un hombre ahí que dice que es un prisionero político. <laughs> y quiere entrar a verla. Pero ¿cómo va a ser eso? How can it be? You're not going to let a political prisoner come in here to your office, right? <laughs> and I smiled and I said, well, first, he cannot be a political prisoner because he's here. <laughs> so he, he must have been a former political prisoner. But yes, tell him the kind of, do you know this man? And I said, no, I don't know him. He, and then she whispered something that for me was a turning point really on working towards an act of justice with people like Alejandro and Jan. He says he's friends with Oscar Lopez Rivera. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry? You know Oscar Lopez Rivera. <laughs> and I said, well, tell him to come in. So here he comes with a bag of t-shirts. I still have a few. And says, we have the St. Sebastian feast is a few days from now, so we just wanted to know if we could collect signatures and here's some t-shirts that, you know, we want, I collect t-shirts, by the way. We want you to wear and, and all that stuff. And, and, and he was like apologetic. And I said, sure, what do you need? And he looked at me like he wasn't really ready. He was ready to fight and convinced me he wasn't really ready for what had happened. <laughs> and he said, I need a table and two chairs. And he thought he was asking for a lot. I said, you got it. What, what else do you need? <laughs> I need to, you to wear this t-shirt. Um, OK, I'll wear it. <laughs> what else? Well, can you get together a group of people? Of course, we'll get together a group of people. <laughs> so I finally said, OK, pues me voy. <laughs> You know, I was like, okay. But, but why do I tell you this, and what does that have to do with Maria? For the longest time, as Puerto Ricans, we sort of have consented to the way we've been treated by the government. And we have to make a very clear distinction 
the American people and the diaspora open their hearts, open their wallets. You know, while here at the University of Illinois in Chicago, they're waiving all kinds of fees. In Puerto Rico today, the Fiscal Control Board is imposing a fiscal plan at the University of Puerto Rico which will make credits go from $55 to $175 credit. They are telling us that we have to close half of the campuses of the 11 campuses of the University of Puerto Rico. So you will always find friends where you think you may not find friends. You just have to be ready to stand up. For me, it was easy. I was very small. You can tell I'm not very tall now. <laughs> and my grandmother, who was a wonderful woman, um, always gave me good advice. She says, you're very small, so when you get in a fight in the school playground, you have to run a little faster, you have to hit a little harder, and you have to scream you know, through the top of your lungs. So I'm 55, and I often joke and I say I don't look it, right? I don't look it. No. No, that, but when I say I'm 55, this is the part where you say, ooh, you don't look it. <laughs> okay, let, let's try that again. I'm 55. <laughs> Thank you very much. And my grandmother used to tell me, you know the lunchbox, we used to have those Aladdin lunchbox that were made out of metal, you use the lunchbox, don't hit with your, don't punch with your fist because you're, you're too little, you're not going to make it. <laughs> she didn't have to deal with my mama when I went home. But she taught me something that is very important, you, you don't start a fight that you cannot finish and you finish every fight, even if you didn't start it, but you got pulled into. I didn't start this fight. That man living on that White House in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue started the fight, and I wasn't about to stand down because the people of Puerto Rico were dying. It went as far as to the Pentagon writing some emails and saying the mayor of San Juan continues to be um, an obstacle, an obstacle on us trying to spin this as a good news story. But, you know, truth finds a way. They send it to a reporter. And the reporter kept saying, look, you're sending me these uh, unsecured emails. And finally, five days later, he said, to hell with it, I'm going to publish them. So he did. So Maria give us a chance to th see things in a different way. Now, I know that there are some words that are difficult to say and hard to accept. But as Jan Sussler reminded me, I think it was yesterday, there are things that are worse being done than said. If anyone had any doubt, before September 20th, after September 20th, it should be a foregone conclusion. Puerto Rico is a territory. It is a colony of the United States of America. That's it. And I know you're not applauding because you like it. I know you're applauding because in order to solve an issue, you have to accept it. Now, that means that we have to wake up and not consent to this anymore. And I have found in the last seven months that there are many minds and hearts and ears ready to listen on how we're going to talk and move forward for a different path. It isn't easy for me to say that, but I will no longer consent to a systematic injustice and neglect of the people of Puerto Rico. Period.
Now, why, why do I know it's possible? Because seven white men voted to hear Brown versus Board of Education in the Supreme Court and ruled in favor of justice. So there are friends anywhere and everywhere. For example, John McCain submitted a bill to exempt Puerto Rico from the Jones Act. So now, do I like everything that Senator McCain stands for? No. But am I going to bite him if justice comes my way through him? Of course not. So it is all about building an alliance to combat colonialism. Because now, it isn't something that we talk about in the cappuccino-filled rooms. It isn't something that is alien to us. Now it is the reason why we didn't get help. We didn't get water. We didn't get medication. And we can blame it on the current resident of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But you know, slavery isn't better or worse depending on how your master treats you. If your master gives you three meals a day and beats you 10 times a week, that doesn't make slavery better than if your master beats you 100 times a day and feeds you one time. The sheer sense of slavery is what is wrong. So we cannot depend any longer on a Congress being good or bad. We have to change the structure that allows for somebody else to, as Gandhi said, be masters in somebody else's land. Now that doesn't mean that we cannot have a relationship. And there are people in Puerto Rico that want statehood. There are people in Puerto Rico that want independence. There are people in Puerto Rico that want enhanced commonwealth outside of the territorial clause. And there are people in Puerto Rico like me that want free association. So what we need to put forth right now is a process by which decisions can be made with the appropriate data where all the voices are heard. Because the minute somebody else, uh, I, I was in Chicago during the weekend, and somebody said, Puerto Rico should be a state. And I said, watch it. And I understand. I understand. But I, 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 want you, but I went to the Supreme Court the other day and took a tour and found this wonderful book, three books I bought, very nicely lined, $6.99 each. One was the Declaration of Independence, the other one was the Bill of Rights, and the other one was the Constitution. <laughs> and there's, there are parts here that if, if we truly love democracy, we have to take seriously. I, I read them again before I came here. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, and they meant men at the time, white and property owners are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So what does that mean? Does that mean that that entitlement is only for the people that wrote the Constitution? No, the United States has evolved and continues to search for justice and equality. And what is happening in Puerto Rico, you're feeling it here. You know, a kid gets shot 20 times when he tries to pull his cell phone from his pocket because he's black. But a white man that killed 17 students 
And Parkland doesn't get shot at once. Now think about it. Women make less than men do. And that's even worse for Latino women and that's even worse for black women. Luis Gutierrez was saying this morning that You know, President Trump talks about the LGBTQ, and I love the way he says it because he doesn't want to screw it up. He says the LGBTQ. I mean, he has to, it's almost like, oh my God, I have to say this. <laughs> but then, he doesn't remember, that's right. But then, let's pull transgender people that are serving a higher purpose out of the military just because of who they are. And you know, I, I don't know, people have asked me often, is it racism, is it chauvinism, is it xenophobia, is it... I, I don't know what it was, ignorance. But what it was gave him the power not to do what had to be done so lives could be saved. And no one should have that power over anybody. Period. And the problem is that we're 42 days from hurricane season. And yes, you have to grant him this. At least from my standpoint, President Trump told the truth once. We are an island. Surrounded by water. <laughs> lots and lots of water. Ocean water. That, that's an actual quote. <laughs> Technically, it's a marchipiela, so he's, also, he was wrong. You're right. I like this guy. You go to this university? <laughs> he was kicked out. I don't say one. I won. So you see, climate change is real. It is not fake news. And it will continue to happen. So as I was telling you, as Puerto Ricans, we also have to own up what we didn't do right. And we had a crisis beforehand because we took more money on loans than we could pay. Somebody loaned it to us knowing that we couldn't pay it, but we shouldn't have, you know, asked for it. So we need to change our priorities. We need to ensure that eliminating poverty is our number one priority. We need to make sure that educating our children is our number one priority. We need to be doing what you're doing here at the University of Illinois in Chicago, welcoming students, Provo, send them back, because we need them back at home. Yeah. Rather than increasing the cost of the credit. So there are many ways that you can neglect people. So, so why do I get off my tactical boots and my cargo pants, which are much more comfortable for me than this suit, which I bought on sale? <laughs> because we still need your help. You know, we don't want to survive, we want to thrive. We want to put health before wealth. We want to make sure that a transgender population is well taken care of. We are the only place in all of Puerto Rico that has a transgender clinic. We have to ensure that we don't continue to allow our union brothers and sisters to lose their benefits. Now, look. The financial situation is very bad. I haven't been able to fulfill all of the commitments of the bargaining process. Are you okay, Alejandro? <laughs> it, 
he deserved it. Now I'm going to tell you the parentheses. He was here in this room, I don't know how many years ago when that, a lot of years, right? So they do this cool thing and they stage a sit in here and, you know, they get kicked out. Uh, who was it that told you, Jose? I won't you don't want to mention names. <laughs> and he says, man, what am I going to do? You know, I haven't graduated yet and I don't know what I'm going to do. And the guy that got him into the situation said, what are we going to do? I graduated last year. <laughs> Oh, it was you? <laughs> so we need your help. Because you see, we have a long road ahead of us. And we have a few things we need to do. We need to diversify our energy production. We can't be addicted to fossil fuel anymore. We have to go to microgrids and Today, uh, at the Illinois Institute of Technology, they were showing me those nano grids, and the other day, Phillips was showing me those Wi-Fi lights that give Wi-Fi. I thought, no, you're kidding me. But no, they, apparently, they're putting them together in a couple of cities in the United States. We have to make sure that the power gets to everybody. I love the word in English, it's power. It's not electricidad because it conveys what it means. When you have electricity, we want, and you have power. And you have the power to make choices for you and your children. We don't want electricity to have air conditioning or to have hot water. We want electricity so that people don't have to use the lights on their cell phones to operate on, so that children can have their nebulizers, so that People elderly that are plugged into their respirators don't die. So that they don't die. We have to get a waiver on the Stafford Act, a complete waiver on the Stafford Act, so that we can rebuild, exact, not exactly as it was, but we, we can rebuild and transform. We have to start on a path to the elimination of the Jones Act yes. completely. Yes. Now, I understand we have to sit down with our maritime, uh, brothers and sisters from the Maritime Union and talk to them about why this is not bad for them, but it's essentially good for Puerto Rico. And we can start by doing no Jones Act on the energy related services and products. That's what USBI has next to us, which by the way, we cannot keep out of the loop also because USBI was really badly damaged. And don't think just because they have their power back on that everything's okay. We have to ensure that our economy just gets jump-started. As of February, Homeland Security put out a chart that said that out of $500 million in contracts that were given out since October, about $50 million had gone to Puerto Rican contractors and $450 million had gone to U.S. contractors. Now, if that does not get to a 50-50 at least, nothing is going to change. And we have to look at this in terms of a system that allows for oppression to take place. Look, I, I, I would have loved to stand in front of a camera with a FEMA t-shirt and say, thank you, FEMA, for giving us back in service what we paid as an insurance. A lot of people forget FEMA is an insurance that you pay for. It isn't a gift. It isn't a handout. And the first weeks after the hurricane, when they finally got part of their act together, they gave us beef jerky and pudding and applesauce 
and Pringles and Babe Ruth, that's food. I don't have any issue with any of those products. Well, maybe Babe Ruth because I'm allergic to peanuts. But, <laughs> but the point is, that's a bad snack for a kid in Chicago. And they would just hand it to us. And the box would say 12 entrees. And the entree was 12 beef jerkies. So structurally, we have to change the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. Because again, you have two choices. You stand up or you stand down. We move forward or we shut up and don't continue to complain. The time for silence has long gone. The time for complacency has passed. The time is now to move forward in a dignified relationship. And the Puerto Rican people have a right to decide what that relationship should look like. Now, I'm in favor, I'm in favor of having Puerto Ricans in the United States and Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico vote for that. But I have to tell you, there's mixed feelings in Puerto Rico about that. People say, well, if you don't live here, you shouldn't decide. Well, you know, you didn't live there, and you send money, and you send food, and you send medication. You didn't live there, and you had our back. So, you know, life is in a cafeteria where you go about and take what you like and throw away what you don't. So I often wonder, what is it about me? What is it? We don't deserve the laws of nature or nature's God. We don't have those unalienable rights. Why? Because we're Latino, we're people of color, we're from the Caribbean, is that it? Because believing that would be drinking the Kool-Aid, the bad kind of Kool-Aid. Believing that would be saying that everything that this country holds dear, it's only for this country. And I don't believe that. That's not the heart of the American people. That's not the heart of the nurses and the machinists and the plumbers and the doctors and the technicians and the truck drivers that I saw day in and day out saving lives in San Juan and 34 other municipalities when 327 AFL-CIO workers went to Puerto Rico to help, left their homes to help. That is the true nature of the American people. And I understand their powers to be now that think that everyone that does not agree with them is fake. Everyone that does not agree with them is not to be considered. But why were we left to die? So at some point, you start telling yourself that it doesn't matter why. It happened. And that you have to hang on to the good natured people of this country that are willing to transform and change society. That if we want a really democracy, we have to listen to people. And the leaders have to follow. And the people have to lead. That's it. So when Jose was describing what I did, I s turned around and told Rosa Clemente, my God, was I courageous or was I crazy? Perhaps a little bit of both. <laughs> and I've had people tell me, don't continue to say what you're saying. But truth has to be told. Truth has to be told. <laughs> so I'll tell you two more things and then I'll stop.
Maria took her homes, took her livelihood. took lives and threw us into a kind of spiral of desperation. D d don't leave, ma'am, don't leave. Don't leave, I, I, honestly, truly. Why do women have to leave because they're taking care of their kid while they're listening to somebody stay? Yeah, because it's always a woman that has to leave, right? So let her be ready for the world and tell what she doesn't like. She may end up being mayor of Chicago. <laughs> and she applauds, look. <laughs> so I, I saw and we saw People with glazed eyes, not knowing truly what hit them. Mother is holding onto a rope to get to the other side. But what she didn't take was our resolve. What she didn't take was our pride. What she didn't take was the spirit and the courage y el orgullo de ser puertorriqueño. So help us. Help us find a new path. Help us find a new way. Help us to hear all the voices. We call it a constitutional assembly where we sit down, we know exactly what things will happen, how will statehood be if it was statehood, how will independence be if it was independence, how would free association be if it was free association, how would the Commonwealth outside of the territorial clause would be, and let us have a discussion period just like what the United States had before the Constitution was approved. But for the Puerto Ricans here, this is the time. There are no more excuses. We either move forward or we don't move at all. I'm the mouthpiece, but I carry within me the voices of thousands of people, of the ones that we did get to, and of the ones that we didn't get to, of the ones that died alone. Because they had no food, no insulin, no ventilator. So I need you to help me let them know wherever they are that their lives mattered. Because we didn't start this fight, but we're gonna finish it. That's right, right? All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Cruz. That was just amazing and inspiring, and, and we're so honored to have you here. Um, I have a very, very small tokens of our affection from UIC uh, to present to you, and I'm very happy to say it's a bag of, of swag, 
And, um, but, but most importantly, Siento acá. No se oye. Ok. Ok. Bueno, no las puedo hacer todas, pero bueno. Ok. Um, ok. Um, I'm going to try to combine a few questions that are very related, uh, but there are some excellent questions here, so uh, I'll do my best job. Um, so one of our youngest members here asked, um, ¿Qué es la mejor manera de ayudar hasta ahora, siete meses después del huracán? What is the best way to help now, seven months after the hurricane, and also adding to that, somebody asked, is visiting Puerto Rico now helpful? What is the right way to visit? Uh, yes, visiting Puerto Rico now is helpful. Uh, tourism has to come back uh, to where it was before. San Juan used to receive 1.5 million people coming only through the cruise ships uh, in the past couple of years. So that is very fundamental. That is one way to help, uh, number one. Number two, there's a lot of foundations that you can give money to. We had to open a foundation called somebodyhelpus.org because people were sending us little dollar bills or five dollar bills and, and so forth from places where I had never heard of in the United States. Um, little flashlights and tower lights and they, it was really moving. So that is the best thing. My, my recommendation would be that if you're going to help, we need a lot of people for, of crews to help building roofs, but make sure that you do it through an organization, whether it be a university, uh, we have a community college that we can work with the University of, uh, of Illinois and Chicago to work that, whether it's a church or a non-governmental organization, but that it's structured, that when you go there, you know exactly what you're going for. And uh, be ready because June 1st, hurricane season begins. So. You may be stuck there for some time, God forgive. 
Anything you see about Puerto Rico, keep us in people's minds. Retweet it. Talk to the people that you know there. Talk about how they're doing, how they're feeling. Write down little stories, snap stories in Facebook, and make sure that we are kept uh, on the narrative and the dialogue. That, that is very important. So now there's a question about the role of youth. Um, there's a couple of them. What advice do you have for young Puerto Ricans who want to impact policy? And what would a movement of youth for Puerto Rican rights look, lo look like? And how do we accomplish it as students? How many days do we have to discuss that one? <laughs> now, look, I think um, the wave of youth movements in the United States is very strong. I just had an opportunity today. Clarissa and I were walking. Um, near the City Club of Chicago. Uh, we just finished an engagement there and there were about 25 students waiting for other students to get there to protest against gun violence. So that, that's right. Uh, they, they had a chant, what, what was it? One, two, NRA, how many kids did you kill today? That, that, was, that was their chant. So the youth movement, I would organize it among some principles. You know, there are people that are going to be more interested in the energy crises, and there are going to people that are going to be more interested in the social crises. Uh, mental health conditions have risen a lot in Puerto Rico. We, most people seem to be in a stage of shell shock or having post-traumatic stress syndrome. So if you do the same thing and you organize amongst core groups, uh, but, but one thing that works is to look for allies. You have, of course, Luis Gutierrez, you have Benny Sanders, you have John McCain for um, the Jones Act, you have uh, Gillibrand and Bela Media Velasquez and I'm sorry I'm mentioning all the Democrats, but they're the ones that have stepped up, you know. But, but make sure that you work in conjunction with them. And my advice would be to keep very far from the partisan politics in Puerto Rico. Because that's going to divide you right there whether you, and I'm a member of a party, but that's going to divide you right there. So, so concentrate and work th around issues, not around, because, you know, th this wasn't a partisan problem. This was a human problem. It was a human crisis. And uh, youth can organize in a lot of places. They can organize in, in schools. But here, for example, the University of Illinois in Chicago and what they have been doing. So we can put together uh, a program where there can be movement back and forth and people can get to do a particular type of job. But the best thing about youth movements is that old people like me shouldn't be giving you advice. That's my great advice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there are several questions that are related to what you talked about at the, during the end of your talk, um, but if you wanted to um, go more in depth, they want to know about what will it take to build a movement that can successfully re resist the corporate colonial agenda um, for promoting, rebuilding Puerto Rico and promoting a grassroots vision to, uh, for the future. And then related to this is what is your vision for Puerto Rican decolonization? Well, there's two things. A, a lot of what Maria did is that she sort of brought to the surface a lot of grassroots efforts that are going on in Puerto Rico. Uh, there's grassroots efforts everywhere, in the cultural um, arena, in the sports arena, in the urban agriculture arena, in the uh, just agriculture in, in general. And, and that is something that people in Puerto Rico are becoming cognizant of, that it is through the power of communities that real change can be affected. And they're, try they're changing the mind frame of politicians in Puerto Rico who rather than, than follow, um, want to lead. So politicians are now listening a lot more intently to what these 
community groups are saying. That's number one. And we have to have a real talk amongst ourselves because in Puerto Rico it is very difficult to talk outside of partisan lines. People can be in agreement, but the minute you say you're from a party and I'm from another party, then all hell breaks loose. So we have to grow up and be able to sit at a table. Now, that happens with respect. That doesn't mean you don't say things the way they are, but it means if you, you know, you don't discard people. You don't say you're a Republican, so therefore you're no good. No, Abraham Lincoln signed the Declaration of Emancipation. He was a member of the Republican Party. So, well, but it's the truth, ma'am. It's the truth. So we, can, we have to stop, from the Puerto Rican perspective, discarding, number one, each other, because we end up, a positive and a negative ends up being a zero. And number two, we have to do the work that needs to be done, which is very painstaking work of knocking on doors in Congress, knocking on doors in the different state legislatures and ensuring that whomever listens to us, listens to us. The situation with Irma and Maria give us a springboard, a platform, a world platform to talk about what needs to change. But we have to be able to sit down. Uh, look, I don't agree in many things with the governor of Puerto Rico. He wants to sell the public electrical authority. I'm against that. He's privatizing schools with vouchers and charters. I'm against that. But if he all of a sudden wants to fight the Fiscal Control Board and really fight the Fiscal Control Board, then let's join forces and get it done. So, so a movement would be an alliance of people that perhaps think differently, but that we can agree on several issues. One, the energy issue, the housing issue, the water issue, the education issue. And then we can push that agenda forward. And yes, the status issue, and the mechanism on how that's going to be resolved, we can all agree upon at some point in time. Thank you. Now it's a question about health. Okay. One is about HIV patients during the hurricane. Can you describe what the municipality of San Juan did uh, with these patients that may have not had access to care and medication? And there's also a question about the, the government's, the Puerto Rican government's response to Sika and um, what is it doing to, in order to keep uh, on top of the reality of the Zika virus? So there's two things. The, the first the municipal entity that began working the Monday after Maria, Maria was from Wednesday to Thursday, so the Monday after Maria, our HIV clinic started working because we were, we were very cognizant that if you don't have your medication, your life truly, truly, wears out. Uh, in fact, we received a lot of aid from the uh, AIDS Health Foundation, and we were able to take about 37 generators to homes of uh, AIDS patients that were or either in critical care or bedridden and so forth. And that was an enormous amount of help for us because it helped us provide a better quality of life uh, for people. So th that really came back really quickly. We bought at the municipality enough medication and surgical equipment for two months. So we had two months, um, a stash of two months worth of all of the medication that was needed. That helped us, but that also just strained our cash flow. So FEMA right now has reimbursed us about $10 million, and they still have between 17 and $20 million that they haven't reimbursed just to the municipality of San Juan. That happens to other municipalities that are in very difficult situations. That's another thing. You say, what can you do to help us? Write to your congressman or woman and tell them that the monies that are allocated have to come allocated to the municipalities as well as to the central government. Because everything goes to the central government. For example, CDBG money, always goes to the cities. 
Now all of a sudden CDBG money goes to the central government of Puerto Rico and they decide which projects get funded. So the, the, the representation through the local assemblies and the mayors has been watered down because somebody else through a bureaucratic process decides what has to happen. Sika, compi, ayúdame aquí. El mosquito es el mismo, ¿verdad? El de Sika. See, it's the, the Aedes aegyptus. It's the same one for Sika, for chikungunya, which I had a few weeks ago. I, was, I, I had a trip scheduled to, to receive a, a, an award in, in Chicago, and I literally could barely move. And then games. So the, the one thing is that with all the debris and rubble, and it took us four months in San Juan to pick up everything. I got a lot of flag from the citizens on that. I can understand them. I can understand why they were upset about that. We had a limited amount of resources and we had to decide whether to feed people, take medication, or uh, begin to clean up. Uh, also, FEMA waited a few weeks, about seven or eight weeks before they came up with the, you'd figure is if, if this was the first disaster, but they didn't give us the rules of the game beforehand and uh, anything that you did before that you wouldn't get reimbursed for, bless you. So Sika is, is going to become a problem but now in the months of July, August, we will start, um, como se dice, la esperación? Spraying, but we don't want to spray because we, we are very cognizant of the pesticides and everything that goes through. So we are looking for a way, uh, and we've submitted to the Department of Health of Puerto Rico, uh, formally and informally, a, a, an environmentally conscious spray that will help us deal with the larva rather than waiting for afterwards. Uh, but it's, it's really an issue of education. Uh, the, this mosquito, for the people that visit Puerto Rico, uh, only bites at dawn and dusk. I don't know how they know that, but that's what they tell us. And uh, as long as you keep long sleeves, uh, it it w won't bite you, light color. Um, but you also have to make sure that everybody at home is always on top of taking away anything that collects water, different plants and everything, make sure that it doesn't, because the, this mosquito lives on clean water. And you may think that you have a pothole and everything is dark water, but no, as it settles, there's clean water and that's where the mosquito lives. It's a, it's a family mosquito, it often lives inside the homes. So there's a lot of education going on. Uh, there has been some pushback from communities and, and from a, a good part of society about providing prophylactics uh, to people, uh, especially the young people. Um, we led, not myself, I was part of a grassroots organization that led a very, very severe and forceful um, opposition to being sprayed with nalet, uh, nalet, you call it in English, nalet. Um, and that was won by the grassroots organizations. So, so it's an ongoing, it's something that we're gonna have to live with uh, continuously and it's something that a lot of education helps us minimize the amount of cases that we have right now. So the last question. Um, so you talked about ideological differences, but there's um, people asking uh, if you could comment on race and racism in Puerto Rico as another difference, but also about sort of the differences across between in the, among the diaspora and uh, whether moving forward um, there's a way in which differences can be unified towards this glorious transformation that Jose was talking about. I think that one of the, and I hate to see good things brought on by Maria, 
But one of the good things brought on by Maria was that the diaspora was no longer a group of people that were far away. The diaspora were the helping hand, were the saviors, were the ones that had us in their hearts. Uh, so <laughs> Maria made us one. And actually, come to think of it, there's five million Puerto Ricans in the United States and three million in Puerto Rico, so perhaps we are the diaspora now. <laughs> and uh, we know how it feels. Now we know how it feels. We know how it feels to have to leave, to survive. So the judgment, although there was some at the beginning, has really been minimal or none at all. 500,000 Puerto Ricans have left Puerto Rico since November. In the last two years, 500 millionaires have moved to Puerto Rico. So there is a sense of a general massive gentrification or cleansing going on. And for this transformation to move forward, we have to be very cognizant of that. Uh, for example, we, had, we noticed that we had people in San Juan buying different plots of land and then asking for a waiver and have them all put together so they can build high rises. So we started saying no. Now, we said no enough that they moved to another town to try and do that. But we have to be very cognizant, and you know, we have a lot to learn from the pe people of Chicago that since the 1950s have been waging this war. Not only the Latinos, but the Polish population and you know, the Italians and the immigrants. So there are a lot of shared, all of a sudden, your fights are our fights, and our fights are your fights. And they're just in a different scenario. So one of the other good things that Maria did is that no longer protesting in Puerto Rico is for the, and this is what they call us that protest, is not for the lefties or the hippies or the people with long hair and tattoos. You know, that grandmothers are protesting. People that have never thought of a protest before are doing so because their communities are being ripped apart because their schools are being closed or because they have spent seven months or because their families are without ener energy or because their families have been ripped apart. Um, just today, we had some piece of good news that uh, Puerto Ricans that lived in the States and were getting help for rent. And again, it's not help, this is FEMA, it's an insurance that is paid for. We're going to see that terminated. And it got extended yet again. Now, you would think that common sense would tell you <laughs> that let's get it extended for a long time because things are not the way that they were. So people cannot go back. But our, our duty is to ensure that those that saw a reason to leave see many reasons to come back. And that movement has to go back and forth. We have to learn from you, and you have to learn from what our reality is. Because it seems similar, and in terms of human condition, it's similar, but in the terms of ways that fights are, are encouraged, it's, it's different. It's very subtle. I, I've campaigned for people in the United States. And you know, we campaign with big tumbacoco and guagua de sonido, and people are making noise. And you know, we have 500 cars uh, you know, going through the streets. And here campaigning is more of a, a town hall meeting and a discussion of, of the issues. We have to learn that. We have to learn to talk about the issues and do so in a civilized manner and ensure that that glorious transformation, phrase which I'm going to steal blatantly from Jose from now on, <laughs> takes place including everybody, even those that don't want to walk. 
even those that don't want to walk. And the way we do that is the ones that do want to walk keep walking. And we keep moving forward. But I think a, a lot of this, and I, I am so humbled by the fact that the university invited me. And I'll finish with this. I, I am the great granddaughter of a sugar plantation worker. Two generations removed from extreme poverty. My parents mortgaged their home twice so that I could come to school in the United States. I was humbled enough to receive the favor of people and become first a member of the House of Representatives and then mayor of San Juan. It is my duty to pay it forward. It is my duty to stand up. But democracy is not about voting every four years or every two years. Democracy is about exercising your right to be you and to be respected and to be treated with dignity just because you're human. That's it. So, so often politics is about this political persona or that political persona. It isn't. It's about people doing the best they can, trying to move forward. It's about people loving each other, no matter who you love or how you love, as long as they're consenting adults. <laughs> that's, that's what it's about. It's about making sure that the political structure that you have works for you and you don't work for that political structure. It's about ending corruption. And it's about ensuring that people everywhere, Muslims and blacks and Jews and Gentiles and Puerto Ricans and Latinos, stand up, speak up, and vote. So you have to vote. 27 million Latinos did not vote. Now the world saw something like this in World War II. One vote gave Hitler power, one vote. One vote. So every vote counts. Every vote counts. So if you have to make it, sometimes you have to break it. But in order to break it, you have to vote. It doesn't matter who you vote for. It really matters who you vote for. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the exercise of voting, the exercise of affirming that democracy is an everyday way of life is what is moving. Because after all, we're only human, right? I don't know if we come back for more lives, but some people say that even when you do, you only remember the one that you're in. <laughs> so don't stop. And universities are the breeding ground for movements, the breeding ground for ideas the breeding ground for ensuring that people have a platform for discussion that is respectful, but honest, truthful, sincere, and sometimes eye-opening. So enjoy college years. I did. I worked a lot, and I partied a lot, too. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Let's give a standing ovation for those of you who remain. Um, and you haven't heard the last of Carmen Yulin. There's more to come. And we look forward to being part of 
that glorious transformation of the Puerto Rican people and the Puerto Rican nation. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that a woman who's been very dedicated to the Puerto Rican community, um, Dr. Uh, Kelly, has brought you a little gift. She's, been a, she's a member of the faculty here in the School of Public Health, has been an amazing supporter of this community. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank ev everyone. Thank the Union for Puerto Rican Students. Thank Amalia for leading this. Thank Andy, who was Andy. He's been so wonderful. And the Social Justice Initiative. Thank you very much.